The ancient skeleton known as Shuka Ka, found in the damp shadows of On Your Knees Cave on Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska, is more than just a human fossil. He is a key that unlocks a deeper understanding of the peopling of the Americas and the relationship to other early individuals, including Anzic One from Montana, Spirit Cave Man from Nevada, and Wizard's Beach Man from Pyramid Lake, providing a complex but revealing picture of the first inhabitants of North America. 30,000 years ago, while nearly all of Canada and Alaska was buried under the massive Laurentide ice sheet, parts of the Pacific Northwest coast, including coastal British Columbia and southeast Alaska, remained partially ice-free. Sites like On Your Knees Cave provide geological and ecological evidence that these outer coastal regions served as refugia during the last ice age, offering habitable environments long before the glacial retreat in the east. This stark contrast highlights the possibility that early humans could have used the Pacific coastal route to enter the Americas, navigating along an ice-free shoreline while the interior and eastern regions remained locked in ice. Along with ancient DNA, burial practices and stone tool technology, these ancient remains serve as vital clues to the migration routes that early humans took as they spread across the continent in the wake of the last ice age. Shuka Ka, which means man ahead of us in the Tlingit language, lived around 10,300 years ago. He was discovered in a limestone cave only a short distance from the Pacific Ocean, and his remains show clear evidence of a maritime-oriented lifestyle. Stable isotope analysis of his bones revealed a diet composed almost entirely of marine resources, seals, shellfish, and fish. His maternal mitochondrial DNA belonged to the rare haplogroup D4H3A, and his paternal Y chromosome was haplogroup QM3, a variant ancestral to the predominant male lineage found in Native American populations today. Life on Prince of Wales Island at the time Shuka Ka lived there was shaped by a rich and diverse maritime ecosystem. Forests of spruce and hemlock covered much of the land, while the surrounding waters teemed with salmon, halibut, seals, sea lions, and migratory whales. Intertidal zones provided shellfish, edible seaweeds, and driftwood, which could be fashioned into tools, shelters, and dugout canoes. People lived in semi-permanent coastal settlements, moving seasonally to follow fish runs or to harvest specific resources. Shelter may have consisted of wood-framed structures covered with bark or skins. Fire was essential not just for warmth and cooking, but also for tool-making and processing marine products. The tools found with Shuka Ka were modest, but telling. Among them were flake tools made from obsidian, sourced over 200 miles away from Mount Idziza in northern British Columbia. This evidence of long-distance material movement speaks to either direct seasonal travel or participation in an early trade or exchange network along the Pacific coast. It also emphasizes the importance of maritime mobility and sea-based networks long before sedentary villages or agriculture took root in the Americas. Due to the deep tectonic valley offshore, even during the lower sea levels of the Ice Age, the coastline of British Columbia was not too different than today although many islands were connected to the mainland. There was not huge continental shelf like there is in Eastern Asia and the Eastern United States. Despite the rugged terrain and unpredictable climate, the island offered security and abundance. Social groups may have consisted of extended kin networks, each with knowledge of local fishing spots, safe harbors, and spiritual landmarks. Language, ritual, and oral tradition would have tied these communities to their ancestors and to the land itself. In this context, the presence of obsidian from hundreds of miles away speaks to cultural reach, memory, and a complex mental map of the northern Pacific world. In sharp contrast, Anzic I was found buried in Montana about 12,600 years ago and represents the only confirmed burial associated with the Clovis culture. The child was interred with more than 100 Clovis-style stone tools stained with red ochre, suggesting a deep ritual significance. These tools include fluted projectile points made from chert and obsidian sourced from the Yellowstone Plateau region. Anzic One's maternal DNA was also haplogroup D4H3A, just like Shuka Ka, and his Y chromosome haplogroup was QL54, a basal variant close to QM3. 
Despite the similarity in maternal DNA and Y-DNA, nuclear genome analysis shows that ANSIC-1 is most closely related to modern Central and South American populations, not modern Northern tribes. This places him firmly within the Southern Native American lineage and suggests that his ancestors rapidly expanded southward shortly after entering the Americas. The Clovis toolkit associated with Anzic I is emblematic of a big-game hunting culture adapted to the plains and inland basins, very different from the marine-focused adaptations seen in Shuka Ka. Roughly contemporaneous with Shuka Ka, the spirit caveman and wizard's beachman lived around 10,600 years ago in what is now western Nevada. Their skeletal remains were recovered from arid desert environments and both men carried maternal haplogroup DNA D4H3A, just like Anzic and Shuka Ka. Their Y-chromosome lineages also fall within haplogroup QM3. However, like Anzic, their nuclear DNA clusters with the Southern Native American lineage, and surprisingly, both show closer genetic affinity to ancient South Americans than to modern Native Americans in the North. Though less is known about the specific tools found with Wizard's Beach and Spirit Cave, the presence of ochre and woven burial wrappings at Spirit Cave point toward a developing symbolic or spiritual tradition. These cultural artifacts, along with shared maternal haplogroups, suggest a wide-ranging population that maintained genetic and possibly cultural cohesion from the Great Basin to the far south. The Great Basin was once filled with pluvial lakes, and the region supported a diverse array of resources that allowed these early inhabitants to thrive. While modern eyes see the Great Basin as a harsh desert of salt flats and dry mountains, this landscape was dramatically different at the time Spirit Cave Man and Wizard's Beach Man lived. Around 10,600 years ago, during the terminal Pleistocene and early Holocene, the Great Basin was a mosaic of vast freshwater lakes, marshes, and river-fed basins a hydrological world now largely vanished, including White Sands region in New Mexico. These water bodies, known as pluvial lakes, were the remnants of a wetter Ice Age climate. Lake La Hontan, for example, once stretched across much of present-day western Nevada. At its peak, it covered over 8,500 square miles, more than three times the size of today's Great Salt Lake. Pyramid Lake and Winnemucca Lake, today isolated desert lakes, were once part of this immense, interconnected water system. These ancient lakes created a rich environment teeming with life. Shorelines would have supported dense vegetation, migratory waterfowl, amphibians, and large mammal populations. Fish such as Lahontan cutthroat trout thrived in the lakes, while marsh edges provided clams, roots, and reeds. Early humans had access to diverse and reliable food resources, from freshwater mussels and fish to deer bighorn sheep, and migratory birds. The burial of Wizard's Beach Man on the shores of Pyramid Lake and the interment of Spirit Cave Man near a now desiccated basin both speak to the importance of these aquatic landscapes. These were not barren deserts, but fertile lake districts, capable of supporting complex seasonal movements, semi-permanent camps, and even ceremonial burial grounds. This ancient water world served as a major corridor for early human expansion. Canoes would have been used to traverse long lake stretches, and obsidian from nearby sources, such as the Coso Volcanic Field and the Yellowstone Plateau, would have moved through these aquatic trade routes. Understanding the Great Basin as it once was, a land of lakes and abundance, helps reframe our image of early American settlers. It wasn't just the coastlines that drew and sustained the first peoples. Inland North America, especially the Great Basin, offered its own kind of richness a now-lost world of water, stone, and opportunity. Taken together, these four individuals represent a branching tree of early Native American ancestry. Shuka Ka appears to represent a northern lineage that diverged from a common ancestral population before the southern lineage that includes Anzic I and Spirit Cave Man. This divergence likely happened around 14,000 to 15,000 years ago, but there are also archaeological and genetic indicators that another group was already in the Americas before the last glacial maximum some 25,000 years ago, who genetically closer to Australasians than to East Asians or Siberians. But that is a topic for another video that we have already covered.
Given their ages, tool types and locations, a migration model emerges in which the first humans moved from Beringia along the Pacific coast, possibly even before the inland ice-free corridor became viable. Shuka-Ka represents a population that remained along the northern coast, adapted to a maritime lifestyle. In contrast, Anzik-1 and the Great Basin individuals represent a rapid inland movement, possibly following river valleys or moving quickly through the Columbia Plateau into the continental interior. The repeated presence of obsidian in these archaeological contexts also suggests that early Native Americans were not only mobile, but also interconnected. The Mount Edziza obsidian at On Your Knees Cave, the Yellowstone obsidian at Anzik One's Grave, and the broader spread of haplogroup D4H3, a maternal DNA, all point to a population that maintained social and material ties across vast distances. These weren't isolated bands, but a continental-scale people capable of moving ideas, materials, and genes across time and space. A recent population model, represented as a synthesis of early Native American genomes, reveals the complexity behind these movements. Around 21,000 years ago, a population split occurred between ancient Beringians and other Native American ancestors. From this divergence, at least two major branches developed one leading to ancient Beringians such as Upward Sun River and Trail Creek, and the other to the ancestors of all other Native Americans. Around 15,700 years ago, this second lineage split again into northern Native Americans and southern Native Americans. Shuka Ka represents northern Native Americans groups, while Anzik I and Spirit Cave fall within southern Native Americans. This southern branch migrate to Central and South America and mixed with a smaller population that was already in South American. The model also proposes the presence of an unsampled population, potentially ancestral to both northern Native Americans and southern Native Americans' lineages, perhaps situated along the Baja coast or in unglaciated refugia such as California. The migration paths suggest that humans were entering the Pacific Northwest shortly after the North-South split, with some moving inland toward the Great Basin and beyond. These routes, both coastal and interior, align with the genetic and archaeological evidence from individuals like Shuka Ka, Anzik I, and Spirit Cave. Shuka Ka's placement along this corridor reinforces the idea of long-term regional continuity in the Northwest. The Pacific Northwest, particularly regions like modern-day British Columbia, Washington and coastal Oregon, likely served as a genetic and cultural motherland, the last shared homeland of these groups before their divergence. The Puget Sound region has a long tradition of maritime travel, with oral history of travelling to Northern California in redwood-hulled boats. Early European explorers, including Lewis and Clark, were impressed by their boats and seafaring, with some boats accommodating up to 100 people. Such a scenario is supported not only by genetics, but also by geography. The ice sheets covering inland Canada were still receding around 15,000 years ago. The only viable corridor southward at that time would have been along the ice-free Pacific coast, especially along the edge of the Cordilleran ice sheet. Here, between the mountains and the sea, lay a narrow but habitable strip dotted with rivers, estuaries, and kelp forests. This was not just a passageway. It was a thriving ecological zone that could support year-round foraging, fishing, and boat travel. The northern branch remained in or near the original homeland, the Pacific Northwest, where it would persist and evolve in relative isolation. From here, cultural innovations like woodworking, advanced fishing technologies, and perhaps even early forms of social stratification developed independently. These traditions would influence later groups like the Tlingit, Haida, and Salish, whose complex societies and seafaring skills echo this deep antiquity. This north-south divergence is one of the most significant demographic events in human history. It transformed a unified population of early migrants into two major hemispheric branches. The Pacific Northwest, long overlooked in favor of the Beringia, now emerges as the pivotal cradle of Native American diversity, not only as a place of entry, but as the launch point of a continental diaspora. The study of the genomes of Shuka Ka, Anzik I, Spirit Cave, and Wizard's Beach offers a compelling narrative of how the Americas were first settled. 
It is a story of both divergence and connection, of separate lineages evolving in parallel ecological niches, and of a people still linked by ancient threads of DNA, obsidian trails, and ritual expression. On Your Knees Cave, perched above the Pacific and soaked in oceanic mist, holds the bones of a man whose genes still whisper across time to others buried under ochre-stained stone and desert sky. As we push deeper into the genomes and geographies of these early Americans, a more nuanced portrait emerges, one that replaces simple arrows on a map with a dynamic web of movements, encounters, and adaptations. Shukaka is not just a fossil from a cave. He is a signpost along an ancient highway, one that still runs in the blood of millions of indigenous Americans today.